couple of things. I sat with a client this week. It was, uh, you know, when we were going over uh, our forecast, uh, the forecast that I have is uh, I think that we're going to have a general slowing. You know that I'm, a, I'm a, a great proponent of business cycles. I think the business cycle has, uh, it's pretty old. You know, they, they, they're only good for, you know, seven and a half, eight years, nine years, and we're over nine years into a seven and a half year cycle. So we're, uh, we're probably looking for a completion soon. I don't know when it's going to happen. Could uh, I know it's going to happen. I know it's going to, uh, we're, we're going to certainly have a, an economic uh, slowdown, whether it turns into recession or not, I don't know. I just don't know the timing of it, but I'm pretty sure that it's coming. So we just have been preparing for, for quite a while. And I'm just, I sat with the client, we just, we're just talking about, um, you know, his uh, real estate uh, uh, core holdings and what a great lifeboat they're going to be for him. And he just didn't get the metaphor. So let me let me just go over this in case you haven't gotten the metaphor. I expect that we're going to have some kind of an economic slowdown. Uh, economic Cycle Research Institute uh, came out the uh, very first part of the year and said, "Look at where we've got a we have a cyclical upturn in uh, in this year in 2017, and of course we've had a reasonably good year." Uh, they came out uh, oh two three four weeks ago in Lakshman Akutan. I mean with with economic cycle research, uh, they're an outstanding, they're an absolutely first class organization. Organization. And they said, look, at this is as good as it gets. And from here on, we're probably slowing down. Uh, a couple other uh, indicators are doing the same thing. You know, Charles Leonard's that way. Um, uh, we've got uh, Martin Armstrong. Of course, he, he's a great believer that uh, he thinks that we're going to start rolling over. So, um, you know, I believe that, too. It's just, the, you know, after you've been around, it's like the fourth or fifth time I've seen this. We just have times where you start seeing uh, business start to slow down. I don't necessarily mean it's going to crash. I don't think you're going to wake up and find out the business has stopped. Um, but I think what happens from here is it starts to slow down. And of course, once it slows down, um, it's going to get to the point where uh, it's, you know, business could become very, very, uh, very, very difficult. So if you are in any kind of economically sensitive business, like like I'm interest rate sensitive, as, 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 in, as interesting as that may be, I'm interest rate sensitive. So as interest rates go up, our business slows down. So um, my business may, may slow down. So I have said, well, what if you're a painter? You know, if, if you're a painter and you're painting houses, everybody's fine. But what if it starts to slow down? Well, people will defer putting a new coat of paint on the house and freshening up the house, or they may do it themselves. Same with a landscaper or a pool, you know, lands, yeah, pool uh, cleaners. There are things that will happen, things will slow down, and they'll start deferring things. And your business is negatively uh, affected by that. So your uh, core real estate holdings in your lifeboat are there to pick up the slack. So if you're making $10,000 a month and business slows 40%, okay, so you, you theoretically, you're going to lose $4,000 a month in, in, uh, in revenue. So one has to say to yourself, play the what-if game. Well, what if it goes down 40%? Where am I going to get this $4,000? That's what your core real estate holdings are, are meant to do. They're there to be not only as a retirement for you later on in life or whenever you choose to, to call retirement because you can retire at any age. But we're talking about if my business slows down, I need an additional source of income that's going to be consistent. And, and we're going to have a cash flow consistent uh, and conservative um, money stream. So if you are missing $4,000 a month on your on your revenue, then your, your core holdings need to be able to pick up the slack. And that's what your lifeboat is all about. Now, that's what happened in the Great Recession. Now, prices went up and down. Our core holdings, our core holdings. And when we say core holdings, these are properties we're not going to sell. These are great properties. These are ones that are always rent, that we really, really like, that are in great areas, that uh, that are in good repair, that we really think are absolutely terrific properties, and we intend to keep them. They become the core. So if they're the core, you're not going to do anything with them. So whether they go up and down, whether they double, whether they triple, where they go down in, in half or they go down 90% makes little or no difference because we're not going to sell them. These are things that we may keep forever right through retirement, uh, right to the day we die, and we, we pass them on to our, uh, to our uh, as a legacy to our family. So, um, but what we do concern ourselves with is how much how much cash flow do they do they generate? And they need to, to generate cash flow. So we have been very, very conservative with our, with our core holdings. And when I say conservative, I mean we're not buying flashy properties. We're not buying expensive properties. We're not ex buying properties that uh, require a, a pretty high rent. We're buying stuff that's entry level, that people can always afford, 
affordable, entry-level, conservative properties and areas that always, always rent. So uh, last time uh, we had the Great Recession, why there was the A, B, and C properties. And A property, of course, is, is new and just absolutely beautiful. And of course, they're high rent. They're the high rent properties. As things started to slow down, you saw people migrate from A properties down to B properties, down to C properties. So we're really looking at the C and B properties that consistently cash flow for us. And, uh, you, you know, we're talking about properties that people will, uh, if they lose their job, they're going to go borrow money to, uh, they may not make the house payment, they may, uh, they may not make the, the credit card payment, they may not make the car payment, but they are certainly going to make the, the rent payment. So this is the type of properties that, that we're looking for, something that's, uh, you know, just the absolutely terrific piece of property. Now, the values could go very go up and down, and I, we've talked about that. I do th expect us to have a little bit of a correction, but I think we're going to be, we'll have a huge um, price increase in, in the latter years. So we're looking to hold this. But in the meantime, these properties are meant as a lifeboat for you so that you can go ahead and keep your your uh, economics and your lifestyle should be unaffected. We want to make sure that you have enough income coming in that no matter what happens to the economy, your lifestyle and your bills are paid for. And that would be your core real estate holdings. Now, let, let's think this, this through, too. Most of these core real estate holdings should have very little debt. And if, if they're cash, they should be, they should be, uh, we, we love to have them free and clear because that, that just mitigates most of your risk. So I've had several people at, tell me about, because I'm saying, well, there's a lot of stock market risk. There's an awful lot of bond market risk. And they say, well, I've done, I've done so terribly well. You know, uh, Trump is claiming he's got like 15, 18. I think Trump actually said 25%. I don't think we got 25%. I think he's at 15, which I think is, is really terrific. I think John F. Kennedy got 18, but. Uh, Ronald Reagan only got like about 14, so I think uh, Trump is uh, like second highest. So I think John F. K. is still still ahead of him, but 25 he has got. But uh, they said, "Oh, I've done I've done so terribly, terribly well." So let me just go over some some of our holdings. So let's say that uh, we move some money out of, out, out of the stock market and you lose uh, 10 percent, 15 percent. Let me just explain a couple of things for you. Make, let me go over a, a few things. We are very, very conservative in what we're buying. So we put an awful lot of, uh, we, we put, uh, if, we, uh, if we leverage, if we put a loan on a property, we put an awful lot down, 30, typically 30%, 40%, 50%. But there are times when you put less. You can get by with 20%. And I like to use 20% because 20 is such an easy number for math. So if we made if we bought a property in January and we put 20% down and that property went up 3%, just 3%. Now, properties have just been have exploded. You know, and and I'm talking properties that are going to 10%, 12%. It's it's uh, particularly ones that, that we're we're in because we're we're at the lowest lowest end and that's where the most pressure is. You know, everybody wants to get into these things because it's cheaper than rent. So our properties have really done have done exceptionally well. But let's just stay with our three percent model. We've done three percent you know, outside of the Great Recession where we almost had like a Mad Max event, we've gone up three percent a year for like 35 years, 40 years, is almost as long as I've been in business, we've averaged at least 3% uh, appreciation on, on the property. So 20% down, and you have the average of 3% appreciation, just three, that's a 15% gain on your money. People say, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a real gain. Well, of course it is. It's like your Apple going up, you know, Apple stock going up $20. You know, you're not getting any dividends off it. It just went up in price. At least with real estate, you get dividends off it. But it's the same function. So if, the, if you have put 20% down and the property go up to 3%, you've earned 15% on your down payment. So let's just take it one step beyond that, is that we don't buy a property unless it cash flows. I mean, if it doesn't cash flow and give us, give us income, we're not going to buy it. What would we do this for? We'd have to be, it would have to be an incredibly unique situation for us to do that. So, but most of the time, we're buying these properties for income. We, we, we want income off these properties. So after, after taxes, after everything is paid for, after you've paid your brokers, after you've paid your management company, after you've paid for any repairs that have been done, you pay your taxes, insurance, homeowner association fee, we still have cash flow. And, you know, typically that's 5% or better. So if you earn 
on a little 3% increase in rent, or 3% increase in the value of the property, that's 15 plus 5% cash flow. You're 20 percent already. You know, if you put a loan on a property, you know what you do? Your tenant has been paying the loan off for you. And typically with 20% down, that's going to give you another uh, three or 4% return on your money because it's typically 15, 16, 17, 1800 bucks a year that your tenant is paying down for you. So if we've earned 15 on, on your appreciation, you've earned another five on cash flow, you earn another four on uh, uh, principal balance reduction, you're at 24% in a normal, average, mediocre, very conservative investment. You know, in a year now, when you when you get up to places like uh, I used to say, uh, Florida, Texas, and, and Arizona, uh, but Florida and, and Texas really have had problems. So we've just been talking about Arizona. We get to places with Arizona. I mean, here in Maricopa County, we get 222 net people moving here every single day you know we have jobs being created your jobs it's the number one it's the number one market in the united states so you know we're doing better than three percent so i have a i have a uh, i have some of my clients i've gone through i have one that's a, a celebrity so i'm, I'm not going to say who that is but uh, um I, I i took over a portion of his uh, uh portfolio that was in the stock market and we put it into and he had learned earned like 10 percent like in 12 or 15 years and his very first year with us was 44.6 percent yeah 44.6 percent we earned first year so uh i i don't expect to get that every year but is it possible that we have appreciation of 3% here in, in, in Phoenix land with, with the growth that we're scheduled for the next 10 years? We're expected to double our population. Sure, of course we can. We can do that. that that's, that's easy. We can, we can certainly do that. You know, so um, if I'm wrong, you're going to get really, really good um, returns anyway. So uh, there is really no downside to any of you building a lifeboat for yourself. You know, build, build a light bulb like on the Titanic. You know, everybody thought uh, it was going to never, would never go down. And yet the Titanic went down and there weren't enough lifeboats to go around. So we're trying to build yours. So that's the, that's the meaning of a core real estate lifeboat for yourself. So listen, this is Michael. I am in Scottsdale, Arizona. I'm here to help any way we possibly can. We actually pick up the phone every once in a while and, and, and talk to our clients. And you're welcome to email us. So my very, very best to you. Bye-bye now.